In the name of Jesus, amen. A reading from Matthew chapter 21, beginning with the 28th verse. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go work in my vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two sons did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you sought, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. This is our text. So as you heard the parable read again just now, did anything strike you as being particularly unusual? Did anything jump out at you as being special? <clears throat> well, you see, this, this parable of Jesus is actually really special. You're one of the main characters, after all. Did you see yourself there in the story? Well, let's take some time. Let's pull this parable apart. And let's take the interpretation that Jesus gives and well, let's apply it to our own lives here today. In 35, 40 minutes or so, we'll all have a much better idea of where we fit into this story. What do you think? Jesus said. And with these words, Jesus pulls us in to the story. He makes us active participants in the story he's about to tell. Jesus expects an answer. A man had two sons. And here, all the characters of the story are laid out for our consideration. There's a man and his two sons. Now the language of the Greek here is, is not just sons. No, it's little sons. Little boys, toddlers, infants even. This language of a uh, son and his father is just beautifully endearing. You can have the image in your mind of a dad going to his 20-something-year-old son and saying, Hey, little man, I've got something for you to do today. Well, that's just exactly what Jesus does. The man goes to his first son and says, Son, go. Go work in my vineyard today. And the son looks up at his dad and with an expression of defiance that all parents have seen at least once before, says, I don't want to. <laughs> Dad does not argue with what the son says. No, he merely turns right around and searches for a second son. Now later, Dad, the son thinks about what he has done. The son thinks about the flagrant disrespect that he showed his father. And he has a change of heart, literally translated as repentance. And he goes out and he works in his father's vineyard. Now in the meantime, Dad goes and finds his second kid. And to him he says, son, go work in my vineyard today. And the son looks up with an expression of love and respect that some may not know what that's like. And he says to him, yes, Lord, I will go. The second son knows what to say. His father leaves him, but the son remains right where his father left him. He leaves the vineyard unattended. Which of the two sons did the will of his father, Jesus asked. And for Jesus' listeners, the answer is clear. 
The first son. The disrespectful son. The son who actually went out and worked in his father's vineyard. Alright, so we have all the pieces of the story spread out before us. Have you figured it out? Where do you fit into this story of Jesus? I'll give you a hint. You're one of the two little children. Which one? I can't tell you, only you know the answer to that. But let's fill in a few more of the pieces and see if we can flesh this out a little bit more. The dad in the story, he is our heavenly father. And we, we are his dear little children. What a glorious picture of reality this is. We are his children. He is our father. This language of father and son presents the beautiful reality of how we are related to God. And just as a child cannot choose who his parents will be, so also are God's children unable to choose him to be their father. God's children are helpless. They are in desperate need of a father. And God comes to them and gives to them exactly what is needed. Just last week we saw this beautiful work of God being done to little Henry Ronson. In the waters of baptism, the Father came to Henry, making him his child. God washed away his sin and gave him the promise of eternal life and salvation. Henry did not choose to be God's child any more than he chose to be born to David and Samantha. God chose Henry. And just as God chose Henry, so also has God chosen you. Through no work of your own did you enter God's family. Through no choice of your own did you become a child of the Most High God. No, God came to you and He worked forgiveness and He worked salvation in you by the power of the Holy Spirit, all on account of Christ's death and resurrection for you. You are a child of God. Why? Because God said so. You are a child of God. Therefore, this parable is all about you. So, which of the two sons are you? Let's revisit our options. The father goes to the first son and says, Son, go work in my vineyard today. And the son looks up at him with a sneer and says, I don't want to. He says a complete disrespect and disregard for the very person who made him a child of God. The first son is kind of like those folks who just don't quite get how this whole Christian life thing works. They are sinners, and everyone knows it. They are sons, but they sure don't sound like it. They don't say the right things. They don't act in the proper way. They don't really know how to behave in the family of God. They certainly do not know how to talk to God with respect and honor. You may even find yourself wondering what God was thinking when he made them a part of his family. In contrast to his disrespectful and ignorant brother, the second son knows what to say. Son, go work in my vineyard today. Yes, Lord, I will go. The son knows that the only acceptable answer is yes. The son's words seem to reflect that he knows exactly what it means to be a son of God. This son, he seems to say the right things. When he is in his father's house, he seems to know exactly how to act. He seems to understand how this whole Christian life thing works. He sounds like a good son, a respectful son, an obedient son. So 
but we know that the story does not end there. In fact, this parable of Jesus is not concerned with the verbal responses of the two sons. This parable is not concerned with what these two sons look or sound like on the outside. In fact, this parable could not care less what the, of the, about the disrespect of the first son or the honor of the second. No, this parable cares about one thing, and one thing only. What the sons actually end up doing. And what does the first son do? Well, the first son has a change of heart. The Holy Spirit leads him to recognize his flagrant disrespect, and he does something about it. He repents, and he goes, and he works in his father's vineyard, just as he said. He acts like the father's son, and he does the father's will. He lives faithfully right where the father put him to be. He strives to serve his neighbor. He feeds the hungry, and he clothes the naked. He strives to be the very best father, mother, son, daughter, employer, employee, co-worker, and student that God has made him to be. And in all this, he never ceases to proclaim all that God has done for him. In all this, he is faithful in telling his neighbor about how much Jesus loves him. And he fails. Oh, he fails miserably to live up to the expectations of his father. But he does not despair. No, he returns to this, his father's house, and he receives here forgiveness. He receives strength and encouragement. For what purpose? So that he can remain in the comfort of this house? No. The son is forgiven, strengthened, and encouraged, so that he can go back out into the vineyard to strive once more to be the son that God made him to be. And in all this, this dear little child of God is doing his father's will. But what about the second son? The second son knew what the right answer was. But then he began to look around and he realized that it may not be all that comfortable to go out into the world to live like his father's son. Sure, sure, he'll, he'll go out into the world, but he certainly won't work in it. He'll leave his father's house, to be sure, but then he'll forget who he was made to be. <laughs> he will live and he will play in the world in a manner that does not really become a son of the father. He'll start to associate with those that despise God's word, the sons who place them outside the Father's favor. They start to imitate the sons of the devil. <clears throat> he may forget who his father is. He may forget who he was made to be. He may forget to return to his father's house. The second son does not do the will of his father, and he suffers the consequences. <laughs> Jesus is crystal clear when it comes to this point. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Jesus asks in Matthew chapter 12. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Again in Matthew 7, he declares, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. In these verses, Jesus is making a definitive declaration. Whoever rejects the Father's will for their life, whoever spurns the Ten Commandments, whoever refuses to live a life of repentance, he is no brother of mine. He is no son of God. Now remember, this 
second son was originally made right before God by God's work alone. By God's work, he was made a son. But now, by his work of rejecting the Father's will, he has turned his back on his Father's gifts. His refusal to live according to his Father's will, to work in the world, placed him outside of the Father's favor. Instead of living in the house of the Father and going out and working in the world, he desired to live in the world. He desired to receive the benefits of living in his Father's house while simultaneously living in the world like his Father's will didn't even matter. Sure, he came to his Father's house on Sunday morning, but from Sunday afternoon to Sunday morning the following week, or longer, he lived like his Father didn't even exist. This refusal to live according to his Father's command is a rejection of his own identity as a son of God. It is a rejection that brings death. <coughs> Alright, let's review where we are. We have the first son who submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit, repented of his sin, received life and salvation from his father's hand, and did his father's will. The second son rejected his identity as a son of God. And he lived like his father's will didn't even matter. In this, he cut himself off from his father. He cut himself off from life and salvation. <coughs> so, which son are you? There are only two options here. There is no middle ground. You may either live as the first son and join the company of the tax collectors and prostitutes, receiving from the Lord's hand life and salvation, repenting of your sin, and going to work in your father's vineyard, always returning to your father's house, to receive his good gifts of word and sacrament. Or, he may live as the second son, together with the chief priests and Pharisees. You may reject your identity given to you in your baptism, and you can live like God's will is an unnecessary burden. You can have no regard for his commandments. You're silent about the love that Jesus has for your neighbor. And in all this, you can risk cutting yourself off from your Father who is in heaven. So, which is it? Repentance or rejection? A man had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, uh, roughly two hundred dear little sons and daughters. And he comes to you and says, Go, work in my vineyard today. Amen. Congregation may rise as we go before our Father in prayer.